I suspect a lot of us got caught in the snow that yes. was uh, coming down. When I left the house this morning about oh, 9 o'clock, just over on the other side of the lake. Uh, there was no snow. As soon as I got on uh, 690, it seemed as though all the snow gods turned against me. <laughs> but uh, welcome to our forestry seminar series. <clears throat> We've had uh, some very interesting seminars Thursday and Friday, and we have two uh, very interesting speakers this morning. The Forests in New York are, I think, probably next to the citizens of New York, forests are our most important resource. They cover more than two-thirds of the land area, are covered with trees, from urban areas to the top of Mount Marcy, and they provide jobs, the, the wood-using industry, from logging through sawmilling and paper manufacturing, and uh, shipping contributes $9 billion to the state's economy each year and provides employment for about 60,000 people. And forest-oriented recreation contributes another $3 billion and provides employment for about 15,000 people. And so we've got 18 and a half million acres of forest land. As I say, more forest land than any other kind of land cover in New York State. The New York Forest Owners Association is a group of individuals who either own forest land or, like myself, don't own forest land but have a continuing interest in seeing that the state's forests remain healthy and productive and sustainable. And uh, let me ask, how many of you are members of the New York Forest Owners Association? Okay. And my word to you is Spread the word. Get others involved. Tell them what a great organization we have and remind them that by joining uh, the Forest Owners Association they can learn more about sustainable forest management, not just for timber, but for whatever uses your forest happens to be of interest to you. Uh, we advocate for intelligent uh, legislation through uh, Forestry Awareness Day and other activities and it, it's a great place to get to know and, and talk to people. Well, uh, our two speakers, our first speaker this morning is going to talk about the timber markets, both the present and the future. You know, yesterday the stock market was way up, but oil prices are also up. So what does that hold for timber in, now and in the future? And our second speaker is uh, going to be talking about various ways of getting different products from your forest, such as renewable energy. I thought about our second speaker uh, yesterday morning as I was stoking my own wood-burning furnace. But a little bit more on our second speaker later. Our first speaker this morning is Andy Metz. Andy is a professional forester. He's a graduate of the College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse. He has almost 20 years experience as a private consultant here in New York State managing uh, forest land for his clients. He's a member of the Society of American Foresters. He is listed as a cooperating consulting forester by the Department of Environmental and Conservation and is a certified tree farm inspector. I'm very happy to present to you Andy Metz. Thank you. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're going to take a look at, uh, as you said, uh, some historical stuff, some uh, recent history, uh, some present pricing, uh, talk a little bit about selling timber. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball, but we're going to maybe uh, talk a little bit about what the future may bring, um, and hopefully a few minutes for some questions at the end. Uh, standing timber values. Um, we're going to talk some general comments, historical pricing, contemporary markets, and uh, so forth. Um, stumpage values. Stumpage is uh, the 
term used for standing trees. They haven't been cut into logs yet. They're still standing in your forest. Uh, the values are based on numerous factors. Uh, the quality of the timber, the volume of uh, timber to be harvested per acre, uh, the market demand. Some things are in more demand than others. Uh, the distance to market. You might have wonderful timber, but you're so far from the, the end user that uh, trucking cost comes into play. Um, did a timber sale on Grandstone Island up in the St. Lawrence once. Everything had to go on a barge. The equipment had to go on a barge. Um, that timber brought about 50% of what it would have had it been on, sh on this side of the, you know, on shore. And it was easily accessible. Uh, it was good timber, it's just the cost associated with getting to it ate up about 50% of the value. Uh, time of year, certain, there is a seasonal nature with certain species uh, and certain grades that uh, they're, they're willing to pay more uh, certain times of year. Uh, timber is, certain products, uh, timber is, is perishable. Uh, logs are perishable, perishable, I should say. And there are certain things they don't want to cut during the hot uh, part of the summer. Uh, the board foot per tree, the size uh, determines to a certain extent what grade of lumber can be produced. Uh, wide and or thick lumber requires larger trees. It's tough to make a, a 10 inch wide board out of an 8 inch diameter tree. I'll leave that to the wood products people. Uh, and your access infrastructure makes a big difference. And example, one of the examples I always use is, uh, uh, that's a, I think it was 2006 in June, it was a big flood in Delaware County, flash flood. They got like six inches of rain in an hour, uh, washed out this landowner's bridge. <laughs> um, we engineered a bridge and replaced it, uh, something to put a truck over. Uh, to get timber out. It's a, it doesn't look like much, but it's a protected trout stream. Uh, and the state really didn't want us driving through it. Uh, doesn't look like much, but that's about $16,000 right there. Uh, we talked about the, uh, the, the lay of the land. The slope can affect the value of your timber. You can sort of see a, a lot, like the sunshine here. You can sort of see a line heading up through here. And that approximates the slope. That's steep enough where you're not going to drive a piece of machinery out across the slope. You'll roll it over. Uh, that site needed extensive uh, side cast roads put into the bulldozer. Species mix. Uh, you may have you may have in your timber sale or your woods species that just don't go together. The uh, the, the two markets are night and day. Uh, and you may not have a buyer willing to do the sorting on his own. He may be a, he may not want to deal, he may have a hardwood buyer who doesn't want to deal with hemlock. Type of logging operation. Uh, operating costs vary by the method of harvest. You know, and the, the, the two extremes are horse logging on one end and, and a fully mechanized operation on the other. Um, horse logging tends to be lower productivity. There's more man time involved in it. Uh, so the cost per thousand board feet is higher, and the certainly the amount of production is limited. At the other extreme, uh, mechanized equipment is highly productive but very very expensive. So they they end up on very large jobs, and they're really not uh, maybe appropriate for a very small timber sale. Uh, landowners' requirements and stipulations. Um, many contracts have a crop. Like you can't you have a conflict with crop production. Uh, maybe the access is through a hay field or a cornfield. Uh, many landowners own their property for recreational purposes, and deer season is off limits. Um, landowner knowledge of values. Uh, when you go to sell timber, oftentimes, or most of the time, I guess I would say, it's, it's a buyer-seller relationship. And if you don't know what your timber's worth, the buyer's probably not going to tell you. He's not, he, it's not his obligation to educate you as to what you ought to receive for your timber. Uh, the method of sale. And I, I put that in bold. Uh, for any given quality of timber, the, the method of disposal may be uh, the most influential. Woods coming into a sawmill come from a 
variety of sources, each with a different cost to the mill operation. Uh, Gatewood. Basically, someone goes out and they make a deal with you to buy your trees, uh, cut them into logs, put them on the truck, take them to the mill. Uh, mill doesn't necessarily know it's coming, it shows up at the gate and referred to as Gatewood. Probably the lowest cost wood a sawmill is going to buy is Gatewood. Uh, trees are cut and they've already been delivered, so there's really no incentive for them to pay a little extra. Uh, next on the list is logs purchased roadside. The trees are cut, you can't put them back up, so you've lost a little bit of bar uh, bargaining power. Um, but they're not on the truck yet and they haven't been delivered to the mill. So you, you still have the opportunity to go somewhere else with them. So you're not, maybe not in the best situation, but you haven't lost all your, your bargaining power. Uh, moving up the scale to privately negotiated stumpage, uh, someone's going to come out and try to buy your timber in, in, standing, in a standing condition. Um, most of the sawmills do that. Um, again, kind of in the middle as far as the cost uh, to the sawmill of, 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 law, of raw material. Competitive, competitively bid stumpage, that's probably 90% of, of what I do, uh, or 90% of the timber I sell is probably done on a competitive bid basis. Uh, and it probably, in my opinion, yields the highest price to the landowner. Uh, and it also is probably the most expensive wood uh, that a sawmill is going to buy, with the exception of company lands. Uh, wood off of company lands is probably the highest, most expensive wood that they're going to saw. Taxes. It, it, trees in, it's the species of trees we have in New York, and our climate take a long time to grow, and the tax bill comes every year, and the cost of holding that land for 50 or 60 or 100 years, um, if you put that off on the forest products to get off the land, um, that makes that, that wood probably the most expensive that a sawmill can have. Um, common sense, but uh, raw material coming into a mill, uh, the cost is average. Because maybe they paid $500 a thousand for one individual's hard maple, maybe they paid a dollar a foot for somebody else's, and it all gets averaged out. Um, if, he's, if I save money on, on this gentleman's timber, I've got a little more to pay for yours. And it's, it's, it's strictly business, but I guess the obvious thing is, why would you want to be, if you're a landowner, why do you want to be the low-cost supplier of wood uh, to a mill? Uh, you will have people who want to cut their own. And, and legitimate reasons to go cut your own uh, logs and, and put them roadside. Maybe you have a small quantity, it's hard to get anybody interested in it. Uh, that happens you know, fairly often. Uh, it may be a quality of work issue. You may have a sensitive woodlot, you may feel you can do a better job than the local logging force. Uh, you may have a very sensitive site, so that would be a reason. Uh, and you, in, in the way the economic times are lately, you may be out of work, you may have some time on your hands. And it's a way to keep yourself busy and, and uh, earn a little money. Uh, if you're going to endeavor to sell timber, uh, know the difference between an offer for your timber and an appraisal. Uh, it's the difference between a buyer-seller relationship and an advisor-client relationship. And probably one of the most important things, if you, can, if you can take anything away from this today, know the difference between what you should be cutting and what I'd like to buy today. And those are two, two totally different things. They're, they're, they might be the same. There's, there's always that chance. Frequently, those are two different things. And it's the difference between someone advising you on what you should be doing and someone who is wishing to engage in a business transaction with you. Um, and knowledge of, of the product source, the quality in the markets, is always helpful. Uh, be an informed consumer. Uh, you know, if you went to the Yellow Pages 20 years ago, you'd see an ad that said, Bill and Ted's log, and we pay dollar signs for your trees. Um, a lot of organizations have done a lot of education for landowners. Uh, Cornell, ESF, 
DEC, and they've thrown in terms like forest management. Well, now if you go to the, the Penny Saver ad or the Yellow Pages, you're going to see Bill and Ted's logging, or Bill and Ted's forest management services. We're still paying you money for your trees. Bill and Ted are still loggers. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but they're not obligated to provide you anything in the way of forest management advice. Um, been tracking some uh, high bid timber prices. Um, you can see we've gone up, we've gone down, we've gone up, we've gone way down, and we've rebounded a little bit. Um, that's a nominal price. That's strictly the stated price. Uh, and we have this thing called inflation. We adjust that for inflation. Uh, you can see it's a, it's forgetting the ups and downs. It's, uh, it's a decreasing, uh, in real dollar terms, it's a, it's a decreasing value. So timber is an asset, uh, at least in the time frame we're looking at here, is sort of decreasing in value. Uh, it's not like gold uh, or oil. Uh, it is, to a certain extent, decreasing in asset value. Um, the uh, uh, black cherry, this peaks right at, at about $1,000, or a dollar square foot, uh, in 2010. But that's, again, the stated price. If we go, if we adjust it for inflation, that $1,000 is really $700. Uh, so it's basically your, your money not being worth as much. Uh, as far as, like, today, we're seeing a range, we're seeing wide ranges, um, and, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Some of it's uh, differences in grade, uh, and some of it is just awareness of prices on the part of sellers. But hard maple, $500 to $1,100 a thousand. Soft maple, $200 to $350. Black cherry, anywhere $500 to $1,000. you are actually seeing hard maple bring more than black cherry. Right now, red oak anywhere three fifty to six fifty, white oak one hundred to four hundred, ash two hundred to six hundred, and that represents a uh, that's kind of noteworthy. Um, ash for quite a few years was kind of a out of favor species, um, and we're seeing prices now four fifty to five hundred is very common. Uh, I've seen some sell for six hundred. Uh, we have the incidence of the emerald ash borer, and in the short term, probably the net effect of the emerald ash borer is, uh, you know, the, the range of ash is this big. Well, at, well, the range of ash used to be this big. Now with ash borer, the range of ash where you can actually draw lumber from is now this big. Uh, but the demand, whatever demand was there, say, five years ago, is now being uh, met by a much smaller land area. So, uh, prices have gone up in New York and Pennsylvania. We can, we can still sell ash, we still have ash to sell, and you've seen the prices climb. Uh, yellow birch, 100 to 300. Walnut, 400 to 1,000. Uh, Tulip poplar, 100, maybe 220 to 1 quarter. Uh, Everybody remembers the mortgage mess of 2008 and the Wall Street panic. Um, we saw a lot of mill closings, reduced signing schedule. Lumberjacks were full. People had been buying anything that they could buy for the previous 10 years. And they, even if they didn't have an immediate market for it, they, they stuffed it in a shed, figuring, well, someday we'll, we'll sell it. Uh, Black cherry lot fell out of favor. And Poor grains of hard maple in that time frame were very hard to get rid of. Uh, a lot of people went out of business. Uh, a lot of people closed their doors. Uh, you saw sawing schedules dictated uh, by log availability. If the yard started to get thin, uh, they laid people off. Uh, lumber sheds were empty. People stopped buying timber, uh, and they started essentially living out of the cupboard. If they needed to fill a lumber order, 
they already had it sitting there in inventory. They just basically spent down their inventory. Uh, a lot of harvesters quit logging, and for a time period there, it was hard to find loggers. Uh, black cherry came back a little bit. Uh, throughout this whole period, when the common grades of lumber were hard to sell, and the poorer grades of logs were hard to sell, uh, veneer was still in very high demand. What, what does that tell you? Uh, I take it to mean that the uh, the people who can afford the higher grades of furniture weren't really affected as much as the general public uh, by the downturn in the economy. Um, so 2010, a large shift in utilization downward. Uh, much less of a, of a tree was taken out of the woods and used as a log product. Uh, log specs were implemented relative to demand. Um, and buyers were playing the volume versus price per volume game. The uh, what, I, what I mean by that is many many buyers of logs, um, their scale is somewhat flexible. When they're really trying uh, to buy logs and timber, they're fairly generous with the scale. Uh, as things tighten up, Suddenly, that log that had 80 board feet in it now scales out at 70. Uh, they, they're, they're not as liberal with the scaling. It's an attempt to cut costs and, and kind of tighten up. Uh, and summed up, buyers are less flexible in a down market. Uh, 2011, despite modest prices, people are selling timber. You drive the back roads and the highways, and you see plenty of log trucks moving around. Uh, why is that? Uh, Taxes keep rising in a weak economy. Uh, many people lost their job. Some people are aware, unaware of the markets. Uh, there's, there's many people still have a need to generate revenue. So uh, there is, there are still plenty of logging going on. Uh, buyers plan the volume versus price per volume game. Again, another thing, in addition to reducing the scale, the other thing you see is. Uh, in an attempt, if, if you're looking to sell and you've gone and got a price sheet from a sawmill or talked to somebody, they want to still be able to say, yes, we're paying, it, we're paying a dollar a board foot for hard maple. Uh, they want to keep, they want to be able to state, yes, we're paying this much, yes, our prices are still good and competitive. Uh, how they do that is, what I've seen in the past year is, well, they're, take, they're, they're utilizing less of the poorer grades. So, they're not bringing the lower grade materials in, the average price ends up higher. Uh, and the other thing is firewood, um, if you look at firewood piles in the last couple years, they're just wonderful. Um, you could, the, the logs that are in some of these firewood piles that I'm seeing, five years ago they would have been sawed, they would have been made into lumber. Uh, but it's not, you know, it's not profitable now. And, uh, so it's very easy to throw them in on the on the firewood truck. Uh, what is moving right now? Ash. High demand for ash. Uh, high demand for walnut. Hard maple's made a bit of a comeback here in the past three months. Uh, they're, they're seeking that out fairly aggressively. Uh, core stock species, basswood and tulip. And that kind of ties in with uh, the veneer and walnut, for example. Uh, a lot of furniture is Solid wood furniture, it's a soft species like tulip or basswood as the core. They slice a veneer and put it on the surface. Uh, it makes a very solid, very stable, very attractive um, panel uh, to be used in a, in a piece of furniture. And uh, you see that when the economy, kind of, whenever the economy kind of turns south, you see people, you see the core stock species picking up because they're making that kind of furniture rather than what, what I would call true solid wood uh, furniture. Still better than particle board, much better than particle board, um, but not true uh, a solid, they call it solid wood. Yes? Isn't the market flooded on one sense? Why do you have the question mark, I guess, with the ash? Um, the uncertainty about where it's, you know, where we're headed with it. Um, 
Right now it's high. It's, it's very high right now. They'll, they'll take every bit they can get. Uh, they would take more if they could get their hands on it. Um, what are they using for? It's, some of it ends up in, in veneer. It's a good, uh, a lot of it ends up in, you know, the traditional baseball bats, hockey sticks, tennis rackets. Um, a lot of it ends up in, you, you can find flooring, you can find furniture. It's a good substitute for red oak. If you, if the, pre, if the, the individual isn't uh, a wood person and it's stained right, it can look like uh, red oak. It's a cheap substitute for red oak. Um, I mean, does the bed in the board come in that anymore? It's, it's moving, I, I'd say the, the, the ash borer, it's moving more slowly than we anticipated a couple years ago. Um, but I don't know anybody who seriously is looking at it like they're going to find a cure for, for the infestation. Um, so the, the, the long-term thing is we're probably going to lose most of our ash, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. So it's not a, I guess it shouldn't be a panic, a panic situation. Uh, it's probably going to take a lot longer than, than, uh, we thought, and, and possibly some of the, uh, you know, the other thing is maybe some of the uh, don't move firewood uh, program with the EC, maybe that's helped. Maybe that's slowed down the spread. Um, has the price for basswood gone up a little bit? It has gone up a little bit. It's not a terribly, it's a moderate to low value species. Two fifty a thousand. Yeah, but if it's really nice stuff, uh, I mean, garbage, junk basswood, you might see hundred bucks, hundred and fifty. Uh, but you might see you might see 300 for really nice basswood. Uh, so, like I said, uh, veneer is moving. Uh, veneer is. Uh, I just do that in an example of a tree that is likely to be veneer. Uh, veneer is never more than a small percentage of any woodlot. Um, it's a it's a rare tree that meets certain specs to have that in it. Um, so if, you know, if, if log production is here and, you, and all of a sudden uh, you have an economic downturn, for whatever reason people aren't cutting timber, and then log production is down here, um, yeah, you cut log production, but you also cut into uh, your, your veneer production because it, because it is such a small component. So even in bad times, the, the, the values there are still pretty high, and the demand is there. Firewood, you can always get rid of firewood. Um, and with oil prices doing what they're doing, uh, probably that's going to continue. Ash markets, moderate to high demand. Um, like I said, we're probably benefiting from quarantines elsewhere. Uh, it's discovered in more counties than that. Uh, I didn't update the, the, the county list. It's getting pretty long now. Um, you were asking about the question marks. Part of the thing with all the question marks is uh, wherever they found EAB, it's been several years old. Uh, apparently, it's incredibly hard to, to detect. And everywhere they found it, they've never found it and said, oh, it just got here. Well, it was here last summer, and that's the first year it was here. Everywhere they found it, it's been three to five years on site, um, which maybe led, lends me to believe that um, the thing can hide for three to five years anywhere before we have the ability to find it. So probably it's a few places we don't know about yet. Who's finding it? The mills? Um, most of it is, is coming on uh, the purple traps. I don't know if people have seen the driven driven some of the roads and you see the purple traps hanging. Most of their most of their finds that I'm aware of have been through the purple traps. And uh, I had an individual told me the other day that yeah the purple traps if you find one that doesn't mean uh, it's not a one like if you find one in a purple trap it's not a one in a million occurrence. If you find one in a purple trap that means there's they're everywhere. It's that's how I guess the way to phrase it is that's how not poor the trap is, but uh, it, it's it's just not. A, they don't have very effective ways of monitoring of detecting it. How long and after they arrive do you think it shows up on the wood? 
I don't know exactly. There's some discussion about it being a one-year, uh, it may be a one-year or a two-year uh, larval process. So they may not, they may be in a tree in, in the larval form and they may have a two-year gestation period where they, depending on, it may be variable. Like depending on growth conditions, they may, some may spend one year in a tree, some may spend two years as a large inside a tree. And, um, it's turning out to be very difficult to find. Um, this was the map, uh, February 2010, so that's essentially uh, 2009 locations. And then you go to 2010, um, Western New York is quarantined, and there's another quarantine area down in Green and Ulster County. Uh, if you go to 2000. 11. The map doesn't change much as far as geographical area. They added this area down here in Orange County. Uh, but they, they, they filled in some gaps. They found a few places. Uh, Buffalo and Rochester area and Bath. Uh, they found a few more occurrences of it. So they didn't add really that much to the map geographically, but they started filling in spaces. What does your quarantine mean just on the ash or on fire? It's, it's ash. And for, it's ash and firewood. So Cuba County is for firewood. No, you can move. You can move stuff out of Cuba County. For Sligo County. Yep. Yes. And I think with with logs, there's something about the flight season. Certain certain mills have like a consent order. They can they can move stuff if it's not during the flight season for the adult. So what are you doing down market if things aren't aren't wonderful and you're not motivated to sell timber? Uh, what can you do? You can always do. There's always improvement work to do. I've seen fairly few woodlots where you could do a little improvement work. Uh, work on low grade sales. Store volume. There's not uh, unless you have a, uh, a financial crisis. Uh, there's always an opportunity to store volume in hope of a better day. Uh, you can't do it if you have, you know, sick trees or if you're a uh, 98-year-old guy with a heart condition. Um, it requires the woodlot to be healthy in you uh, if you're going to wait 10 years. Uh, you may want to consider cutting some ash. Uh, and I guess I haven't seen anything. There are efforts uh, being carried out to try to find a, a cure or a solution. Um, I don't know anybody that holds a huge amount of hope for it, uh, but the efforts do continue. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is the beetle is spreading more slowly than first anticipated, so it shouldn't be a panic situation. Uh, it's probably not going to be here tomorrow, and if it was, in, in many cases, larger trees are still salvageable uh, for a time period after uh, you've, you've found the, found the beetle. Um, never hurts to work on your regeneration. Uh, if you've got regeneration, uh, there are so many more options open to you in your woodlot. For some, selling in down markets is unavoidable. Uh, seek out the help of a professional. Learn about market conditions uh, before you strike a deal. Uh, utilize tax laws to your best advantage. Um, capital gains treatment. Uh, for most people, you're probably better off selling trees than logs. Uh, you could do a 631A election. Uh, which would get you capital gains treatment on, on a log sale. Um, my understanding of that is, though, it's an election and the IRS doesn't let you flip back and forth. So for a given investment, once, you've head, once you head down that road, you're probably bound to that for the life of the investment. Um, calculate your basis. Uh, you, you bought the property, you paid something for it. So when you sell timber, there's a portion of your sale that is non-taxable because it's a return of your investment. It's not truly income. Uh, so you'll want to do that to limit your, your gain. Uh, and this one, a lot of people are surprised at this. You might be selling at a loss. There's no guarantee that when you sell timber you're going to make money. Um, uh, we don't know how long this is going to go on. Uh, we had the favorable capital gains rates the maximum of which is 
uh, the maximum regular income rate for an individual, 35%. Um, with all the budget talk, 2012 might be, this might be the last year that we have that capital gains rate in a, in a short holding period. Um, and I've seen this one happen. I've seen people who bought maybe about 2,000, they bought a, a timberland investment, they bought at the absolute height of the timber market, uh, sold timber for less money uh, because the market dropped, and did it in a manner where it, it was eligible, uh, it was considered ordinary income. And actually paid taxes on a deal where they they got less for the timber than they paid for it and owed taxes on it. Um, as I said before, uh, favorable capital gains rates were extended past their 2010 expiration date, which got us through 2011. Uh, it's anybody's guess where we're headed. My guess is. Uh, the tax situation is going to change. Stick to your management plan. Uh, two courses of action that landowners get talked into during challenging markets. Cut everything to generate more money. You may regret it when the when the cycle turns around. And cut only the best because the rest aren't worth bringing out of the woods. Uh, that ends up, it's, 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 in essence, it's high grading and it's going to lead to a diminished future potential. Um, and that's a real risk, especially when the high grades of timber are worth money and the low grades are suffering. Uh, there's a temptation to just grab the good ones. Uh, in general, uh, you know, why is the market down? Well, largely due to housing starts. Uh, you think of all the things that lumber gets used for in a house, uh, and housing starts are way, way down. Um, the draft of housing starts. Um, the peak was eh, mid-2005, and it started going down from there. Uh, and I just threw that in there, the, the, the slope of the, of, the gra of the lines almost match the housing starts. The, the timber prices followed housing starts. Uh, you know, in that 2005, 2006, 2007, right in that range, uh, housing starts were almost two million, and we're down. I, I've seen figures like below half a million for 2011, and estimates for 2012. So we're in that 400, 500, 600 thousand range. Uh, so you took it into, you took a, the home building industry went from two million homes a year to half a million. Um, we're, and we're, in the future, we'll probably have to get back to something between half a million and a million uh, before we see that really turn around. Uh, and another outlet uh, would be pellets, crates, and boxes, solid wood packaging, uh, heavily dependent on manufacturing. And what have we not been doing since the economy went south? Manufacturing. Um, Overseas isn't much better. Uh, you know, our the stock market goes up or down based on the mood in Greece uh, for the last couple months, uh, whether they're going to fix their debt problem or not. Uh, so it's not just America. None of our no, nobody else is spending any money either. Uh, the big unknown is uh, energy costs for a lot of households. Uh, energy is a big deal. Um, and it really affects their other discretionary spending. So if we have five or six dollar gas, probably nobody's running over to Stickley and, and buying a new uh, dining room table. Uh, and over the years, getting, getting close to the end here, uh, over the years, some of the most commonly asked questions that I get, and so I thought I'd throw them in here. Uh, what diameter should I cut my woods to? That's, a, that's always a favorite. Uh, don't you make the most money by selling logs roadside? And shouldn't I remove the big trees and let the little ones grow? And the nice part about this quiz is I'm going to give you the answers. Uh, what diameter should I cut my woods to? Well, you shouldn't. Um, pretty much anybody that's expressing a harvest in terms of 
a tree diameter or a stump diameter, uh, it's you're well on the way to high grading, and you can actually use that as a test. That's probably not the person, somebody that, that is recommending a diameter to you, it's probably not the person you want to turn loose in your woods. Um, don't you make the most by selling logs, roadside, and my answer is almost never. Uh, for that to work, you need a sawmill industry just literally starving for logs. Um, they need to be, they need, you need to be, almost have a log famine for that to work. Uh, they need to be ready to close the operation down before they'll pay more uh, for, for, for their raw material that way. Um, I've seen it happen in 20 years, I've seen it happen twice when there was enough competition and they were hungry enough where the roadside log price would yield more money to the landowner than a standing tree. Um, and shouldn't I remove the big trees and let the little ones grow? Um, it's not that simple. Um, you have to really look at the age structure in your woods and very often the little ones are little for a reason other than their age. Um, Fairly frequently in this part of the road, we have the even age stands. So the little trees, you know, the six inch tree is the same age as the 18 inch tree. It's real common with hard maple um, to, to go into a woodlot and see that that diameter distribution, and they're all they're all relatively, you know, within within five years, they're all the same age. Um, so were you to do that, you would in, in essence be taking the best producers out of your woods and keeping uh, the underperformers.